and, and one for the ages um, of their individual stories. Well, as it turned out, three years into the bolt hole and the shotgun shack, I found a gold mine on the 10 hectares I've got down there. A real one from Billy Green's era. And there was uh, $25 million of ore that got taken down to the beach there uh, before a big storm came in and washed it all away. So that's what happened to that mine. And this year, I finally found something that I've been looking for for 10 years. It was a legend. It was a myth. It was a rumor that, that, that this was in that valley. So I won't tell you about that, but I will tell you how I bring it together. Tama and Billy Green and Dr. Sababa connect their lives and deaths in a rock cave containing a skull, a silver button, and a greenstone club. So that'll connect them. So there are other things in the bowl hole. There's tefa tefas and tattoos and horses and helicopters and all those things that you can read for yourself up there. And you might ask what a tefa tefa is. That's a tefa tefa. You've seen two of them already in the slideshow. This one's mine. It's actually not mine. It belonged to a very important chief, Rangatira. And you can tell because of the split hawk's feathers that are hanging from it. But this, I made Tama's weapon of choice. Magnificent little machine. It's made out of torture wood. So now we come to the ideas part. And I probably hooked you a little bit with this. Coastal sand bleached with bones and stream banks veined with gold. Turns out the first bones were moa bones at the Maori Gate, and they bleached the coastal, coastal sands. And the second bones were Maori bones that the Maoris killed, and they bleached the coastal sands. So the ghost of Hemingway came to visit again just before I read this, and it said, from things that have happened and from things as they exist and from all things that you know and all those you cannot know, you make something through your invention that is not a representation but a whole new thing truer than anything true and alive, and you make it alive. And if you make it well enough, you give it immortality. That is why you write, and for no other reason that you know. So I write on three levels. Uh, those of you that have come to my talks before have heard me say this. Uh, there's, a, there's a baseline lyrical level, which is yada yada, you read the story. Happy, happy. There's, a, there's another level of factuality science, historical detail, which you can leave alone or not. And then final, finally, in the stratosphere, there's an ethereal level, there's a metaphysical level, there's a philosophical level, which is the real juice of the book. Okay? So, uh, the excerpt I've chosen to read from you is at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay? It's totally lyrical. It's almost irrelevant to the, to the novel because it gives you no clues as to what's happening to who. What it is, it's a trip that Dr. Sababa decides to take on a road that he'll never take again. This is a New Zealand road, it's not a typical New Zealand road, but they can get like that. And the only thing worse than the roads in New Zealand are the drivers, of course. <laughs> There is a road in the Coromandel called the 309 Road, which is the topic of my reading tonight. The 309 Road, I'm not sure, does this cursor work on this? Yes, it does. So the 309 Road goes from here over the, over the central mountains to the State Highway 25. It doesn't look like much, it's just a little red line. And that's really all it was. So they warn you when you drive the roads in the Coromandel. They, roared, they, they warn you in the wrong order. They go gravel, steep, narrow, winding. But they should really go steep, narrow, winding, gravel. <laughs> because that's what it is. And I, uh, oh, Dr. Sarabi, rather, sorry, <clears throat> had an automobile. which is a 1970s Holden station wagon. <laughs> and it was built like a brick shell. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to tell you, this is, this is the 309 road. It's a little bit of it. 
That's the 309 Road. So I'm going to read you the excerpt now so you can lie back and enjoy. If I can get the pages right here. Assuming I got the right pages. Here we go. It had been one of those perfectly crystalline summer mornings when Jane left him for a few days to take care of family concerns. Her Uncle Bill suggested Dr. Sababa drive his son's old copper-colored Holden HQ station wagon north to camp in the furthest forest of the peninsula. Take the bronze Weiler, he said. It's a great way to disappear for a few days and see the most remote part of the Coromandel. Dr. Sababa eyed the massive metal machine in Uncle Bill's driveway with suspicious. Suspicion. It's big, he mumbled. It's indestructible, Mike, said Uncle Bill. Runs like a buck rabbit. Dr. Sababa accepted the offer with alacrity and gratitude and asked Uncle Bill for directions to the remoteness. I take the 309 just south of town, he said. There's twists and turns and a few potholes. But from Wittyang, it's 22 kilometers of winding gravel in the northwest diagonal along the Mahakirao stream to Coromandel Town on the east coast. From there, it's straight up the guts to Colville and beyond. Dr. Sibaba asked him why it was called a 309. Number of bins in the road, I guess, said Uncle Bill. More than a number of minutes a horse and buggy took to drive it. Not sure which. The good doctor threw his sleeping bag and tent in the back of the bronze whaler and carefully navigated out of Uncle Bill's gravel driveway. The old man waved from the deck, anxious to see him off on his adventure. Dr. Sababa stopped at the Wittyanga supermarket and filled up the back seat with two boxes of tinned food. The only eating utensil he would need was a Swiss Army knife. The whaler roared into the bucolic pasture land on the State Highway 25 south of Wittyanga until it reached the turnoff of the 309. Gorse and scrub and native bush began to fill in Dr. Sababa's peripheral vision, but the tarmac continued smooth and deceptive for the first two kilometers before turning into dust and stones at the quarry. The whaler blew past tree ferns and building blocks of rainbow-colored beehives and the black squiggles on a yellow traffic notice warning of the 309 loops and bends that would form the next 10 kilometers. Another side, Red and lime green spoke of local artisanal activity further down the road. 309 honey, three kilometers. The tires of the Holden gripped the gravel uneasily, fishtailing on the curves and overcorrecting on a few straightaways. The gullies on the edges of the road grew deep and wide. Vehicles passing from the other direction raised clouds of fine dust that lasted only as long as it took to reach the next one. Dr. Sabawa was experiencing his first solo flight in hostile airspace. New Zealanders consider driving as just another extreme sport. <laughs> With classic all-black elan and strategic intent, every car is an obstacle to scoring another goal, every road is a slalom course, and every giveaway sign a mere suggestion. There is no blind corner too hidden, no passing interval too short, and no single lane bridge too long not to be taken at full speed and full volume. Kiwis don't so much drive as aim, and what Dr. Sabawa was soon to discover, the rules of engagement were the same on the motorways as on the poorest, narrowest, corkscrewiest excuse for a road, like the 309. What had started as an excursion was quickly turning into a race between Dr. Sababa's skill in mastering the bronze whaler and the 309's determination to become more and more unnavigable. A short burst of pavement at the old coach Road turnoff, promise civility. Before it snatched it away. The road began to rise towards its 300 meter summit at the halfway mark. But Dr. Sababa would never see it. Nor the Cowrie Grove, nor Wyo Falls, nor Castle Rock, nor the Chiltern Reserve, or Coromandel Township, at least on that day. The gravel narrowed and climbed into a precipitous horse track of tight, blind curves, squirming between sheer drop-offs into space on the left 
and retaining walls and steep gray wacky bluffs on the right. The guardrails along the sheer drop-off side were made of thin wooden planks painted white, whose function was obviously not to prevent a vehicle from falling into anonymity, but to confirm that this was, indeed, the direction. It was around one of these gritty turns that Dr. Sababa found himself on a collision course with a large white luxury vehicle <coughs> hurtling around the corner on his side of the gravel. Four young girls appeared to be chewing gum and chatting at the same time, and one of them was pushing her multitasking skills to the limit in attempting to aim her vehicle. Dr. Sababa, with his lightning-fast analytical ability, came to three sequential conclusions in a matter of milliseconds. The first was that these young women were likely from Auckland, given the gap between their age and the cost of their means of transport, their obliviousness to the rest of the world, and the straw hats. The second was that if he could just nudge the bronze whaler ever so slightly to the left, he might be able to demonstrate his chivalry and avert a collision, thus saving the day and its participants. The third thing that Dr. Sababa realized, having resolved the first two, was that a chivalrous intent had been ever so slightly miscalculated, <laughs> resulting in an attempt by the left side of the massive metal machine to leave the rest of the encounter slowly, but ever so irreversibly. The whaler began a slow crocodilian death roll off the left edge of the 309 and over the bank of the sheer drop-off into space. It could have been a ballet if there hadn't been so much metal in play. Not only the steel of the whaler was in the air, but at a precise rotational angle. All the tin food in the back seat boxes flew onto the field, into the cockpit airspace, and around the befuddled expression on the twirling face of the good doctor. Fortunately for Sababa, Uncle Bill had been right about the indestructibility of the old Holden wagon. In three complete axial revolutions through the solar system and down the steep embankment, the bronze whaler did not break. It did, however, lose most of its height as the roof was crushed nearly flat by the impacts with the slope before it was stopped and jammed immobile by a large old rimu tree that had spent its life waiting for this precise moment halfway down the escarpment. Sebaba was stunned by the accident but relieved that he was still alive and that none of the cans had smashed his skull. 